Exodus 14. Let me get to where I'm supposed to be on this. Okay. <laughs> yes. Three responses to a dreadful dilemma. Three responses to a dreadful dilemma. It won't take you living life very long before you face what seems like an insurmountable uh, problem. That's a dilemma. A dilemma is a problem that has no seeming apparent answer. And we're going to find one in the Bible here. Now this is uh, when the children of Israel have come out of Egypt. They're fleeing from Egypt. Now this is a great victory. They've just conquered Egypt. The great armies and foes that have been enslaving them for 400 years. So this is a great victory. And in our life, we'll find similarities between this. You'll find great victories in your life spiritually. And then right on the heel of it comes the very thing that you thought you had conquered. Exodus 14, verse 1. Now, we'll get to the message in a minute, but I'm going to stop and hit a couple of things in here that are just too good to pass up. Um, Exodus 14, verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, that they turn and encamp before Pihirah, between Migdal and the sea, over against Belzephon. Before it shall ye encamp by the sea. And Pharaoh will say of the children of Israel, They are entangled in the land, and the wilderness has shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, uh, that he shall follow after them, and I will be honored upon Pharaoh. Um... Okay, he's, he's, he's left some important details out here. They're told in verse 4 of this chapter that Pharaoh's going to be defeated. God's going to get victory over him. But they're not told what the, the steps to get there are. They're not told that in order to get victory, they're going to have to do the impossible. They're going to have to cross the Red Sea on foot. But he didn't tell him that. So let's just keep that in mind as we read. And upon all his hosts, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. And they did so. Now that's kind of a tongue-in-cheek there. He says that I am the Lord. Because when, he, when Moses comes to Pharaoh, Pharaoh's response is, Who's the Lord? Who's that? Who are you talking about? I'm the boss here. That'd be in Exodus 5.2. And then you can put a cross-reference for Job 21.15. So God says, hey, look, the one you didn't know, you're soon going to know, and it'll be as you're being extinguished. Verse 5. And it was told the king of Egypt that the people fled, and the heart of Pharaoh and his servants was turned again uh, against the people. And they said, why have we done this, that we've let Israel, uh, let Israel go from serving us? They don't have a very long memory. It wasn't... <laughs> It wasn't two days ago they were saying, let the people go. Anything you want, we'll help you get out of town. You know, we're all dead men if they don't leave. Verse 6. And he made ready his chariots and took his people with him. And he took 600 chosen chariots and all the chariots of Egypt and the captains over every one of them. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he pursued after the children of Israel. And the children of Israel went out with a high hand. Okay, the children of Israel go out with a high hand. That means they go out um, supreme. They, they have the advantage. But the Egyptians pursued after them. Now that's the world. If you want to line up with the world, you'll be in a constant pursuit, a constant struggle, a, a constant trying to obtain something. That's what Israel is, or that's what Egypt is doing here. They're trying to get to Israelites. But the children of Israel went out with a strong hand, or a mighty hand. High hand, that's how he says it, with a high hand. So if you're on God's side, if you'll stay true to him, you'll go where you go in power. It won't be a struggle. It's not a pursuit. Verse 9, But the Egyptians pursued after them. All the horses, the chariots of Pharaoh, and his horsemen, his army overtook them encamping by the sea beside Pyrrhira before Belzephon. And Pharaoh drew nigh, and the children of Israel lifted up their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord. Now they got a funny way of crying out to the Lord. Look how they do it. 
Verse 11. And they said unto Moses, Wait a minute, I thought they were going to cry out to the Lord. <laughs> but they're doing it through Moses. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to, uh, to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. Now remember, what does Moses know so far? Only that God's promised to get victory. He doesn't know how or when. For the Egyptians whom you have uh, seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. For the Lord shall fight for you, and ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel, that they go forward. But lift up thou thy rod, and stretch, it out, stretch out thine hand over the sea, and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry land, uh, go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will get me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon his host, and upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. There's the details that were left out of verse 4. But it took um, a long time before they got all the details. Verse 18, And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, and upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel, removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. And it, became, uh, and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud of darkness to them. But it gave light by night to these, uh, to these, so that the one came not near the other all night, except maybe in their imagination. <laughs> Can you imagine having seen the Egyptians coming up on you, then all of a sudden this cloud covers it. God says, I'm using this cloud to make a division, to put a pause on the, the charge. So the Israelites don't know what's going on on the other side of the cloud. They can't see it. So their imagination is probably running wild. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night, and made the sea dry land, and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went to the midst of the sea upon dry ground, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left hand. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them in the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses and his chariots and his horsemen. And then you can continue reading, but it, that's where they get their demise. He, closes up the ocean and or the sea and they die there so we'll look at we'll look at something that happens in here the children of Israel have gone they're going between, between two mountain ranges at the end of this mountain range is the sea the Red Sea so they are trapped they're trapped right there the only way to get out is go through the sea or fight the Egyptians so in their mind, they've been led into a trap. Here's what happens when they realize there's a dilemma. We're going to be killed. We, came, we did all this preparation. We did all of this work to get here. And now it's for naught. It's for nothing. There's three responses that'll happen. And we have the same three responses when life hands you what seems to be the impossible. Exodus 14, verse 11 and 12. The first response is an accusation. And they said unto Moses, Because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Well, there were graves in Egypt. Matter of fact, 400 years worth of them. They meant their graves weren't there, because they hadn't died yet. Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us, to carry us forth out of Egypt? Is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians, than that we should die in the wilderness. So their first response is an accusation. Accusations come in different forms. 
this one uh, we'll, we'll look at one accusation is an ill intent is um, mo the bad motive okay so they're going to accuse Moses of having a bad motive this is nothing new. It started in Genesis. Uh, the, the trap the serpent set was to blame God for having a bad motive for his restriction on the tree. In Genesis 3, 5, he says, For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. How does he know what God knows or doesn't know? But he's assuming the sale, and she bought right in. <laughs> he said, I know what God knows, and let me tell you what he didn't tell you that he knows. That's like me saying, I'm going to tell you what's in Kim's mind over here. I don't know that. Food network. Yeah, there you go. You're right on it. <laughs> Look at uh, Second Chronicles chapter 32. Second Chronicles 32, verse 15. It's tempting to blame God for having a bad motive when we get into um, these troublesome situations that life hands us perpetually. Now therefore, let not Hezekiah deceive you, nor persuade you on this matter, neither yet believe him. For no god of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people out of mine hand and out of the hand of my fathers. How much less shall your God deliver you out of mine hand. That's the way it seemed sometime. And that's the way it seemed to the Israelites. Okay, God had done all of these wonders. He had done all of that stuff. But suddenly, when they're faced with um, uh, this mighty warrior force against them, those things have faded off into the past. Now, that was fairy tales from the, from the past and the reality of right now is somebody's about to kill me. Mm -hmm. When they should have flopped that, they should have made the reality what God's power was and proved in the past and appropriated it for the present. In Numbers 6, 22. Numbers 6, 22. <clears throat> Here's the way God thinks from his own lips. This is the way... Um, this is what God's true motives are. Number 6, verse 22 to 26. So when your heart or someone else tells you God has a bad motive, turn here and you can get God's words on what his mind is. Number 6, verse 22. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto Aaron and his son, saying, On this wise shall you bless the children of Israel saying unto them. Okay, so God, the Lord, has said, here's what I want you to let the people know from me. Here's what they need to know. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. There's nothing bad about those motives, is there? That's God's heart. That's what he wants for every individual. Now, it's tempting to say we've seen um, how severe his punishment can be. No, duh. But just stay away from it. Don't touch the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then you get this. That's the other extreme. God is an extremist. He's also a terrorist. He's supposed to put his terror in you so you'll stay away from evil. For your own good. Correct. Correct. Deuteronomy 4, verse 31. Deuteronomy 4, 31. It says, For the Lord thy God is, uh, is a merciful God. He will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he sware unto them. God is not out to forsake or destroy you even though people and life circumstances sometime will con you into thinking that. The fact of the matter, from his word, he'll tell you what he thinks, how he acts, what his motives are. 
in Jeremiah 29, verse 10. Here's even after he has punished a man. This is Israel. He's punished a nation for 70 years. But that's not what's on his mind. The punishment's not what he's thinking about. The punishment is not where God's focused. That's no, um, that's no challenge for God. He could snap his finger. You know, it's very simple for God to, to uh, reprimand us. All he has to do is compromise your immune system. All he has to do is let a splinter go up your fingernail. <laughs> and he's diverted your attention immediately. Jeremiah 29 verse 10 For thus saith the Lord that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon I will visit you and perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. So even though he's having to punish them he's still focused on hey look there's a good day coming and I've got all these things worked out. Just like right now he said I've gone to prepare a place for you. That's what his focus is right now. He's making up something nice for you. Even though your life may require reprimand. That's not his focus. His motive is something much bigger than that. Verse 11. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. Now, that's a famous verse. And it's a good verse. But don't pull it away from the context. The context of that verse is 70 years of punishment in Babylon. So even though you may have to endure some punishment and some reprimand from God, know that that's not where his mind is. He's not dwelling on punishment that has to be given. Even in the punishment, he's thinking thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you an expected end. So the first thing that we tend to do, um, as far as an accusation, is a ill intent, to, to try to find and accuse God of his own motives. The next thing is we'll accuse God of not giving us safety. Safety ignored. Okay, you, you're not looking out for my good. My safety was ignored. Psalms 106 verse 7. Psalms 106, verse 7. It says, Our fathers understood not thy wonders in Egypt. They remembered not the multitude of thy mercies, but provoked him at the sea, even the Red Sea. Okay, so they've made God mad. How? They provoked him at the sea. Remember what they said? They said, hey, look, uh, we told you when we were in Egypt, it's better for us just to stay here. We're safe. You know, we're comfortable with the, um, the enslavement we've been put in. We've learned to live with that. Okay, look at it in Exodus 14. Right, yes. Their mind is really uh, fickle, just as ours is. Um, verse 12, uh, Exodus 14, verse 12. Is not this the word we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, Let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? Hey, we've learned to handle this bondage. We've learned to be slaves. Just leave us alone. We're comfortable now. <laughs> you know, it's the frog in hot water. It keeps getting warmer and warmer till it fries. He says, hey, look, I'm having a good nap here. Leave me alone. <laughs> for it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians. Okay, serve the Egyptians? You're slaves. <laughs> then that we should die in the wilderness. So th they did not understand what was going on here and they provoked God they made God mad 
at the Red Sea. Um, because they're saying their safety was ignored. Now we're going to die. You brought us all the way out here. You let us into a trap and we're going to die. Well, that's not very mindful of all the miracles God had just performed for them. Why would he do all that just to take them out there to kill them? Psalms 81 verse 12. Now this is a recounting the history of Israel. This is not at the Red Sea. This is talking about later on in their, their history, but it tells you the way they think. Psalms 81 verse 12. This is God talking. So I gave them up to their own heart's lust, and they walked in their own counsel. That is, they decided what was right and what was wrong. They didn't want to hear what God had to say. They had better ideas. Verse 13. Oh, that my people had hearkened unto me, and Israel had walked in my ways. I should soon have subdue, subdued their enemies and turned my hand against their adversaries. That's many times our problem. We don't wait long enough. Right around the corner, it's always the fiercest fight before God gives the victory. Egypt now, not not only just enslaving them, now all the forces are ready to kill them. They're used to being told to do something. But hey, they got to live in the Taj Mahal. They did. Pison and Ramses were called um, trophy cities, uh, treasure cities that Pharaoh wanted to build. So they were living in the best of the best. And Goshen. Those are all treasure cities. Those are the richest posh population. They had the best of the land. Remember, they got the best of the land when Joseph brought them in. So, really, they did have some good things as far as the world is concerned. But uh, now, all of a sudden, they're out there. The enemy is facing them, about to destroy them. And God says, hey, look, don't provoke me now because right now is when I'm ready to subdue your enemies so we've got to focus right we've got to focus where it should be look at Psalms chapter 78 Psalm 78 53 usually your problem is not your problem it's somebody else's the Red Sea seemed to be the insurmountable object. They couldn't get across it. But that was not the problem. The Red Sea was intended to be the demise of Egypt, not Israel. Psalm 78, 53. And he led them on safely. So they feared not, but the sea overwhelmed their enemies. A lot of times God hides everything. He doesn't tell you exactly how it's going to be and you don't get a foreshadow, you don't get a sight of how you're going to get out of it. Because if he laid the battle plan out there, the devil could see it. Sometimes it's hidden from you and the devil. It's hidden from everybody. And he gets to pull through at the last minute and do what he does, be the savior. Accusation. Sometimes accusation comes in the form of um, imagined defeat. Our imaginations love to run wild. <laughs> we can imagine all kinds of things, and usually the imagination is not um, how great God is going to give us deliverance. <laughs> it's usually just the opposite. In 1 Kings 19, verse 1. 1 Kings 19, verse 1. Everybody faces the same problem. Even one of the greatest prophets in the Bible is not immune to this. 1 Kings 19.1 This comes right on the heels of Elijah killing the prophets of Baal. That's a major feat there. That's a spiritual victory if you've ever seen one. Chapter 19, verse 1-4 to And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. 
and withal how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger unto Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I make not thy life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. He said, Hey, buddy, you killed my guys? So help me if I don't tomorrow at this time make you just as dead as them. Now, wait a minute. He just killed 400 prophets of Baal, and he's scared of one woman? But he is. Let's read it. Verse 3. And when he saw that, he arose and went for his life. He said, if I don't move, if I don't get out of here, if I don't run from this woman, I'm going to be dead. So to save my life, I'm going to run. Now remember that phrase. Because <laughs> this is what happens if you're not thinking right. When you're not thinking right, you contradict your own self. He's doing this here to save his life. Okay, now we'll keep reading. And came to Beersheba, which belongeth to Judah, Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree. Juniper tree, that's a, that's a good study for you. Find out about the juniper tree. And he requested for himself that he might die. Well, wait a minute. If you want to die, why don't you just stay there? Jezebel's going to finish the job. Yeah. <laughs> he was fleeing to live, and now he tells God, kill him. Which is it? Make up your mind, buddy. <laughs> and said, it is enough now. Oh, Lord, take, a, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. He's imagined the defeat of himself. He's imagined that Jezebel can win. He wasn't imagining that a few days earlier when he had slung, slew, when he killed, <laughs> when he killed 400 prophets of Baal. Slew, that's the word. First um, Kings 19, 14. And he said, this is what happens. You, he's justifying himself. He wants God to kill him, but he wants God to know what a great person he was before he does it. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord God of, his, of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, and thrown down thine altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. Okay, well, he's seeking to take his own life away. He was, just a few seconds ago, begging God to take it. Kill me. Get me out of here. He says, I'm the only one left. That's the normal thing that happens. The, we accuse God of leaving us alone. It's all on us. We're alone. It's all our responsibility to take care of this. And it's not. Look at Genesis 50, verse 20. A lot of harsh circumstances can happen in life. And us not understand them. This is Joseph. Now we know the life of Joseph. He's um, had it rough. I, I dare say none of us have had the Joseph experience. Um, this is after his brothers uh, get back to, to Egypt. And it's a happy powwow. Verse 20. But as for you... Ye thought evil against me. A lot of times your circumstances are a result of someone intending to do you harm. Mm -hmm. But there's somebody bigger than any human or circumstance. It's God. And no harm can come when God says there can't be any harm. But God meant it unto uh, good. To bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Your circumstances will turn out right if God's in control. Psalms 119.71, he says, It is good for me that I have been afflicted. That doesn't sound very good, does it? But he says, It's been good for me that I've been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. That's where the learning is on an accelerated rate. 
when you're afflicted, you do learn if you intend to. You either learn or you rebel, one of the two, that I might learn thy statutes. Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are the called according to his purpose. It's hard to keep that in mind when circumstances don't feel right. <laughs> but you have to. All things will work out right. Look at it from God's point of view. He's working things beyond our knowledge. If we could understand it all, we could be God. We're, we don't have that much brain power. Okay, three responses. There's an accusation. This is a big word. Everybody's going to have to learn this one. Acquiescence. Acquiescence. That's the act of agreeing, accepting, or giving consent. Um, acquiescence would be like um, you just give up. Oh, whatever. Just let them come kill me. <laughs> Exodus 14, verse 13 to 14. And Moses said unto the people. Now you notice, he's not prayed here. We saw God talk to him early in verse 4. But now we're down to verse 13 and 14, and there's been no mention of him talking to God. Now he's doing this on the fly. He's trying to motivate the people without any input from God. And Moses said unto the people, Fear ye uh, not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show, you to uh, show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, ye shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you, and ye uh, shall hold your peace. Okay, so he's come up with a, with a way to answer their objection. He said, what we're going to do is I'm just going to tell them the part that I know. Rather than run, go ask God, what should I say to these people? He says, well, I know some things God has told me, but God hadn't told him all the details yet. We hadn't hit verse 17. So now he's going to motivate them. This is a, um, an ultra-optimist here. He's saying, look, it's going to be just fine. But he's all doing it all on his own power, his own mind power. Um. The first thing about acquiescence, look at this one. This is the hypocritical um, hyperbole. That is, he's, uh, he's going to tell them something, but he doesn't really believe it himself. Um, he's going to tell them, hey, look, everything's going to be just fine. And it won't be long. He'll be in there doing the very thing these people have been doing to him. He'll be on his knees asking God, how in the world are we going to get out of here? You've got to do something. In Romans 2, verse 21, he says, "Thou there, Romans 2, 21, Thou therefore which teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? When you go to, go to give somebody some advice, it's best to do it humbly and uh, do it with... Um, with a finger pointed right back at yourself as you do it. If you're going to teach another, you better be teaching yourself prior or at the same time. Thou that preachest a man should not steal, dost thou steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, dost thou commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast of the law, through breaking the law, dishonoreth God. So you have to be careful when you give advice that the advice you're giving, you've heeded yourself. Moses here is talking on the fly. He says, look, i got to tell them something. We're going to have a mutiny. And we're not even in the water yet. <laughs> 2 Timothy 3.5 2 Timothy 3.5 This is man's motivational tactics. This is what God thinks of them. 2 Timothy 3, 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. You know, your God has promised that his word won't return void. Man's spiritual sounding words 
he says here, are just a form of godliness, but they have no power. The only thing with power is the one who created the universe with just a word. His word has power. Isaiah 29, 13, he says, Wherefore the Lord says, For as much as this people draw near me with their mouth, and their lips do honor me, but have removed their heart far from me, and their fear toward me is taught uh, by the precepts of men. He said, This is what happens. These people have gotten comfortable with a religion. They've gotten comfortable, Moses has gotten comfortable with being convincing. He's just let out all of these people. He's gone before Pharaoh time after time, and God has used him. But don't get comfortable or cocky in that. God doesn't have to use you. And the only thing useful is God's message, not your own. Isaiah 48, 1. Isaiah 48, 1. Hear ye this, O house of Jacob, which are called by the name of Israel, uh, which are called by the name of Israel, and are come forth out of the waters of Judah, which swear by the name of the Lord, and make mention of the God of Israel. Those are all good things. You want to do those. But not in truth, nor in righteousness. It's easy to talk good. It's easy to put on the act. But if it's not from the heart, it does you no good, nor your hearers, anybody who hears you. In Isaiah 10, Isaiah 10 verse 5. Isaiah 10, 5. O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger. And the staff in their hand is mine indignation. This was a wicked nation. God says, I'm using them. They're going to perform miracles for me. Just like the rod that Moses lifted up. He said, the Assyrian is going to be my rod. And I'm going to use it on Israel. Look at verse 6. I will send him against a hypocritical nation. They say one thing and don't believe it. And against the people of my wrath will I uh, give him a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Hey, so there's the, um, that's what happens with a, a hypocrite. A uh, hypocrite given a motivational speech. <laughs> Doesn't work out too well. Um, how about a conversation? This is what he's doing. He's conversing. A conversation without consecration without um, sanctification he's not reviewed that speech given it to God and said you weed through that and tell me what I can say and can't say he didn't do that he should have in John chapter 12 verse 4 it's easy to speak spiritual and seem right on we could even throw some verses in on it <laughs> but be totally wrong. Humans uh, have to work really hard to have a good motive. <laughs> God doesn't, but humans do. Here's Judas. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Doesn't that sound spiritual? That sounds like a good thing to do. Or six. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief. And he had the bag and bear uh, what was put therein. So, this woman who's anointed Jesus with this costly perfume, Judas says, hey, that shouldn't be. You know, we're missionaries here. We need to put it in the pot here. And, you know, I'm holding the bag. That's, you know, let, let's give this money out to poor people not wasted on perfume that's not a wise purchase um, now it's easy for us to claim okay that's Judas Iscariot we're not Judas Iscariot okay I agree we're not Judas Iscariot I hope not uh, let's see another account of the same story Mark 14 4 Mark 14 4 
And there were some that had indignation. Some, that means more than one, that had indignation within themselves. That's a group. And said, why was this waste of ointment made? So Judas was not the only one with the same mindset. Although Judas was the one that betrayed Christ, the um, Antichrist epitomized or pictured, even though that was Judas, there was others that were in the same boat. We have to be careful or we'll be in the same boat. Um, so make sure your conversation has been filtered through Jesus Christ. Find out what you can say and can't say, no matter how spiritual you think it sounds. Amen. Exodus 14, verse 19 to 20. I'm going to show you something that's subtle in here. Exodus 14, verse 19 to 20. It says, And the angel of God, which went before the camp of Israel. What does that mean? That means, you remember the, the cloud and the pillar of fire? It was to move. It was moving. They should have been moving. It went before the camp of Israel. Okay, now it's saying, okay, you're not going to follow me? Okay, I've got to do something drastic here. What he had intended is the same thing Joshua does. When Joshua comes through, they continue to walk. When they step into the Jordan River, it parts. That would have happened here had they followed the angel of the Lord like they were supposed to. But they didn't. They balked. So he removed and went behind them, and the pillar of the cloud went from uh, before their face and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud of darkness unto them, but it gave light by night to these, so that the one came not near the other all the night. Okay, three responses. We've seen the accusation, the acquiescence. Now let's see action. Action. Now, action can be good or bad. Just because you're taking action doesn't mean you're doing the right thing. Action has to be done out of obedience, not out of impatience. Um, but here, in this case, they should have taken action. They should have continued the action God had started. Exodus 14, verse 15. And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? <laughs> he said, Get up, boy. You're wasting your time. Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. See, that's the message God intended. That whole message, the whole speech that, that Moses had given them was not the speech God intended. Because here we find what God intended. The speech God told him that he's supposed to tell the people, speak to the children of Israel that they go forward. Had he been given God's message, that would have been the one he was given. But lift thou up the rod, and stretch out thine hand over the sea, and dry, uh, divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. We have to continue unless God gives you a different order. Don't make up orders, but when God's given you an order, continue it regardless of what Red Sea's in front of you. He'll part it, or else he'll give you another order. Romans 2. 2 verse 7 Romans 2 verse 7 it says to them who by patient continuance that's a tough part right there patient be patient and keep on patient continuance in well doing seek for glory and honor and immortality eternal life part of this Christian life is being patient and doing what you're supposed to do continually, regardless of what seems to be changing circumstances constantly. Second Thessalonians 3.13 Second Thessalonians 3.13 This is a short verse, but a good one. But ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. Don't look for a way to change things. Just continue doing well. Otherwise, you've become a servant to circumstance. 
Colossians 1, verse 21. Colossians 1, verse 21. And you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your minds by wicked works. There are some actions you can take that are the wrong actions. <laughs> That'll make you the enemy of God. By wicked works. Yet now hath he reconciled. Okay, so now you're saved. In the body of his flesh through death. To present uh, you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. Okay, who here is unblameable, cannot be blamed for anything, unreprovable, in God's sight? Not man's sight, in God's sight. That's God's intention. God's intention is to refine you down so that when he looks at you, he sees you as unblameable and unreprovable in the sight of God, not man. I might look at you and say, I don't see anything wrong with that person. They're like Job. They're perfect. But God can look at them and see things that I can't. God says, I'm going to purge that out. When I look at them, I'm not looking as a man looks. Verse 23, here's where it comes. If you continue in faith, you've got to continue in it. There has to be some determination to stick to it. In faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard, and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereof I, Paul, am made a minister, who now rejoice in my suffering for you, and this is a tough phrase, and fill up that which is uh, behind of the affliction of Christ Whew. in my flesh for his body's sake. He said, Jesus Christ left some afflictions for you to complete. He said they beat him, they did all the he got all the major ones, but he left a few minor ones down there that still need to be completed. That's going to be your task. Complete the afflictions that Christ left, which is the church. In Job 17 verse 10 he says, "Upright man uh Upright men shall be astonished at this, and the innocent shall stir himself against the hypocrite. The righteous also shall hold on his way. The righteous is going to stay on his path. When you get on the path, don't, don't leave it. There is no shortcut. Stay on the path. <laughs> God set them on a, on a course that they couldn't make any moves. They're between two mountains. <laughs> They had to go to the sea. It was obvious. Um, and a lot of times God will lead you that way. He'll lead you so you don't have any room to make any decisions. Mm -hmm. There's no choice. You have to keep moving. Mm -hmm. And he that uh, hath clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. The farther you continue, the stronger God will make you. Why? Why? Because you're going to need more strength for what's coming up ahead. <laughs> Not because you're going to become some, um, you know, he-man. It's to prepare you for what's ahead. You're going to need the strength. He doesn't waste anything. So if he's giving you extra strength, it's because there's a bigger battle ahead. He's not doing it just to make you feel strong. Uh, verse 10. But as for you all, ye uh, return and come now, for I cannot find one wise man among you. This is Job telling off his supposed comforters. In John 8, 31, it says, Then Jesus said uh, to those Jews which believed on him, If you continue in my word. It's not enough just to hear it and to have read it once and suppose that it is accurate. You know, that's simple to do and that's a good thing to do, but don't stop there. You have to continue in it. If you're still breathing, you've continued to breathe. Okay. You didn't take one breath and say, hey, that's pretty good. That'll do me. I'm done. Do the same thing with the Bible. That's your life. Uh, then are you my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. What's the truth? It's my word. His word, not mine. <laughs> okay, in conclusion. The response to life's dreadful dilemmas 
There's three that come up naturally. The accusation, the acquiescence, or an action. You'll have one of these responses to life's dilemmas, or you'll join Pharaoh. So you either respond with one of those three, or you join the enemy. All of the wrong moves will feel like the simplest move. <laughs> the right move is always the hard one. In Mark 4, verse 3, Jesus is going to give us an example of somebody who makes all three of these choices and in the possibility of joining Pharaoh. Mark 4, verse 3. Hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. That's Pharaoh. They joined Pharaoh. The fowls of the air, they joined the wicked. That's somebody who joined Pharaoh's team. Verse 5. And some fell on stony ground, where it had not much earth, and immediately sprang up, because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and, be, uh, and because it had no root, it withered away. There's the people who accuse. They come up, and they've got plenty to say, and they wither away. You know, the accuser doesn't get any comfort from it. He's just accusing. It's not like it's benefiting him. <laughs> it doesn't change the circumstance. Verse 7, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. There's the acquiescence. They give up. The thorns conquer it. Verse 8, And other fell on good ground, and did yield fruit that sprang up, and increased, and brought forth some thirty, some sixty, and some an hundredfold. Alright, that seed took action. It bore fruit repeatedly. And he said unto them, He that hath ears, let him hear. That's, that's what God intends. Now there's the choices that can be made. And you'll make those many times over in your life. But be aware and conscious of it. And make the right one. In Ezekiel 29, we're going to find something. Ezekiel 29. Now we learned Wednesday about the number 5. We'll see it again here. Ezekiel 29. Pharaoh is never good. Egypt in the Bible is not a good place. Ezekiel 29, verse 2. Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him, and against all Egypt. Uh, it's Ezekiel 29, now we're verse 3. Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lieth in the midst of his rivers, which hath said... Here's what he's going to say. Notice these personal pronouns. My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. Man, it's hard to make a sentence with that many pronouns. <laughs> but he does it. Now... He does that. How many time, How many personal pronouns are in that? One, two, three, four. My river is mine own, and I have made it for myself. This is satanic. It's a, a dragon, and it's connected with the king of Pharaoh, or king of Egypt, Pharaoh. Watch God's response to it. God says, okay, you like personal pronouns? Let me give you some personal pronouns. Verse 4. But I, one will put hooks in thy jaw, and I, too, will cause the fish of thy rivers to stick unto thy scales, and I, verse th uh, number three, will bring thee up out of the midst of the rivers, and all the fish <clears throat> of thy rivers shall stick unto thy scales, and I, number four, will leave th thee thrown into the wilderness, uh, thee and all the fishes of the r thy rivers, Thou shalt fall upon the open fields, and thou shalt uh, not be brought together, nor gathered. Number five, I have given thee for meat to the beast of the field, and to the fowls of heaven. That's Egypt. That's Pharaoh. That's their demise. 
God's already declared it, just like he did with Moses. He said, don't worry about it. I've cooked this whole thing up so I can get them all together. I got the whole army now. I'm going to destroy them all with one whack. I'm going to drown them all at once. So when life's problems seem to be insurmountable, remember, maybe God's just putting them all in the same place so he can destroy them at once. There he's, he's declared five times. Five's the number of death. That means it's over with. He said of Pharaoh, he'll be no more. You're not going to see him anymore. All right, so that's our message for today. Let's, uh, let's pray and keep that in mind as we go throughout our week. Guess what? We've probably got dilemma, uh, dreadful dilemmas coming. <laughs> Most of us have already seen some. If you're young enough to have not seen any, then pat yourself on the back, but it won't last long. <laughs> All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that you've given us um, some insight into life and that uh, we know we can depend on you and that you have our best interest at heart and that... Um, we can uh, depend on the fact that you are greater than any of our um, perceived um, enemies. And we pray that you would help us to uh, keep our focus on your power and not the power of um, what's coming after us. And thank you for this food that we're going to eat. In your name we pray. Amen.